Well, this is, uh, this is a uh, very exciting day for me. To be able to come back to my alma mater and speak, um, I can't even begin to tell you what that feels like. It was 44 years ago. Uh, it's hard to believe. And it's particularly exciting for me to be able to do this in front of our president, who I was lucky enough to be here for her inauguration. And what she's done in four years, not only to Springfield College, but to the community, is mind-blowing. Um, I'm here today to talk about success. But really, the question needs to be, how do you define success? You know, I often speak to companies, King Street Capital, BlackRock. They're all about metrics. They're all about what did we do in our first quarter? What is our, you know, our earning practices? What are we trying to do going forward? That's one form of success. To me, it all comes down to relationships. To me, everything is about relationships, building a spider web of connectedness so that through this life journey that we are on, we can touch and affect people. And in so doing, we can get them on board so that we're all rowing in the same direction because that's the only way that we can be successful. When I was speaking to the president a few minutes uh, only a minute before we uh, came in here, we were talking about how, what makes us successful in society today. And she said, you know, you have to be able to adjust. Constantly adjusting on the fly. That's where we are today. So here I am, I'm in the Springfield College Hall of Fame. I think I'm the only person <laughs> in the Hall of Fame that was cut by his coach three times. <laughs> which just shows that I wasn't a good listener back then and I don't think I'm a very good listener now. Um, Springfield College, it's a triangle, spirit, mind, and body. As I've traveled around the world coaching, I'm the USA coach and uh, I've done a lot of different things, almost no institution I've come across understands the critical component of spirit, mind, and body. The balance that a person and an organization need to have to truly be successful. We're being forced into these silos where we're only focused on one thing. You've got a, a doctor, all he knows about is one category, another person, another category, and you're bouncing around trying to get an answer to things. This is all about balance. This institution is all about balance. This organization here seems to me to be all about balance. To see people come up and talk about, I love what I do, i challenged by finding the balance, I love my family, that's a beautiful thing. So this is, to me, the essence of success. Talking about adjustments, ironically, a year ago today, I went in for double knee replacement. Because I'm such a good candidate for double knee replacement, I'm fit, I'm strong, my gosh, this should be easy, right? So I go in, we do the pre-op. So first thing we do is we do a stress, or an angiogram. No, nope. the first thing we do is an EKG. And the doctor says, ooh, we don't really like the way that looks. So the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna do a stress test, right? We do the stress test, doctor says, that really doesn't look great to me. Let's get you on a table, we'll do an angiogram, no problem, we'll do the operation right after that. Angiogram. Next thing I know, they're circling the screen. They're bringing in the nurses. Look at this. You know, wow, wow. And I'm thinking, what in the world is going on? The doctor comes up to me and he says, you have the widow maker. An hour later, I had open heart surgery. My bad knees saved my life. I had to adjust. I went in with one mindset. Next thing I know, my life has changed, and now I have a whole new mindset. And those are the kinds of things that blow your mind, but you have to be able to adjust to be successful in this world. Things are moving so fast. It's so different than it was 44 years ago when I was given my little beanie when I came to Springfield College as a freshman. It's just happening too quickly, so you must learn to adjust on the fly. So how do you succeed in this world? First of all, you must, and this is the beauty of sport, you must set up your plan, have a strategy, go into battle, adjust on the fly, win or lose, 
learn from losing, and don't make those same mistakes going forward. And it's only through that process that you truly learn how to be successful. And so, how do we do it at Trinity College? The first thing that I demand of our players is that they live a life along the lines of the awesome power of now. Now, I didn't make that up. That's Dr. Richard Peck. He's a very smart man. It's the second most sold book behind uh, the Bible. So I thought that was a good person to steal from. I want my young men to live every day like their hair is on fire. We don't do that in this world. We kind of go through the motions. That's not acceptable. Today is a gift. So totally immerse. Make it the best day you've ever had. So I tell the young men, when you go to class, make it the best class you've ever been to. Well, how do you do that? By fully engaging, fully investing yourself into that class. Don't just listen to the professor. Challenge the professor. Ask questions. Get involved. OK? When you come to practice, I want it to be the best practice you've ever had. Because if it isn't, I'm throwing you out of the gym. I want you fully invested. After practice is over, I want you to go to dinner. Make it the greatest culinary experience of your life simply by making it so. When you go out on that date tonight, make it the most romantic tryst of your life. You can do that just through investing yourself. So that night, if St. Peter comes knocking, you can say, St. Peter, I'm ready to go because I had one hell of a day. If you can start living your life that way, you'll be amazed at what you can accomplish. If you can get a team thinking that way, you can create a swirl of energy that simply cannot be beaten. When we played against Harvard in the national finals, and we had no right beating that team. It was at Harvard. They were the better team. We went in there, and I told the boys, every match, boys, is nine against one. We are so unified. We're so engaged. We're so focused. They can't deal with us. They want nothing to do with us today. Just by investing yourself fully into the moment. Now, it's interesting. I've somehow, um, when we wrote this book, it had three themes to it. The first one was life lessons in sport. Well, everybody's written about that. There's nothing no, no, you know, novel about that. The second thing we talked about was learning how to manage fear. And in this environment, in the world we live today, there's more fear than has ever been before. We just don't know what to expect anymore. Every day is so incredibly tumultuous. And then the third thing I did was I wrote this book as an apology to my three grown children. Because I was so busy trying to be the greatest coach in history that I wasn't there for them when they were growing up. And so I wrote an apology to my three grown children. I felt that they needed to hear it. Now when I'm asked to speak to groups, companies, retreats, that sort of thing, I've somehow become the expert on work-life balance. And I say, have you not read the book? <laughs> you know, I am here simply to tell you the epitaph of my life, and you can decide how you want to live your life. I was recently speaking at a retreat in Virginia, and it was about work-life balance, and a man's cell phone rang. And I looked at him, and I said, who's that? And he said, it's my wife. And I said, what does she want to know? And he said, she wants to know if I'm coming home for dinner. And I said, and the answer is, <laughs> yes, you're going home for dinner. So I ask the boys in my charge to give everything they have, live life to its fullest. And then on the flip side, I'm saying, but when you go home, give the people who really count your undivided attention. Totally invest yourself into that part of your life. Because when we go meet our maker, He's not going to say, Paul, how many national championships did you win? Which was, by the way, 16. But at any rate, uh, <laughs> but who's counting? He's going to say, how'd you do? Did you do the right thing? Did you do good? To me, that's the most important component. Immerse yourselves in every aspect of your lives, including the most important piece of it, when you go home to your family, to your partner. Then you have a true spirit, mind, and body connection in life. And that is how we need to live our lives to be truly successful. Before I open it up for questions, and we started late, so I had to really fly through this thing, and I apologize, I thought I'd share a story with you about adjusting. In 2002, 
I was selected as the US Olympic Coach of the Year because I'm so special. And the next day, I got a phone call from the Red Sox. And they said, how would you like to come up to Fenway Park and throw out the first pitch? And my thought was, I cannot think of a more deserving guy. <laughs> of course I will come up and throw out the first pitch at Fenway. It'll be my pleasure. And actually, it'll be your pleasure. So <laughs> word gets out on campus that Coach A is throwing out the first pitch at Fenway. And your kids are coming up to me, hey, Coach, are you, are you practicing throwing? Are you loosening up your arm? 60 feet, 6 inches. I can do that in my sleep. I'm a professional athlete. So we're getting close to the day of the event. The boys are going to be on the field with me. They're going to get their national championship rings. And then I'm going to throw out the first pitch at Fenway Park. Now, my daughter is a sophomore at Trinity College at this time. And she and her sorority sisters are buying tickets in the bleachers. Do you know why they're in the bleachers? So that I cannot see how drunk they're getting at the baseball game. <laughs> so the day arrives, and it's a freezing cold night in Boston. That's important to the story. It's a freezing cold night in Boston. How many of you have ever held on to a brand new baseball? It's very slick. Very cold night in Boston. So here we are. We get up to Fenway Park. And we're on the field, and here I am with my peeps. This is where I belong. There's Jason Veritek. He's as big as a house. No more Garcia Parra. His forearms are bigger than my legs. There's Kurt Schilling. He's 6'11". His wife is a smoke show. This is where I belong. I'm here with my peeps. And as they're throwing the ball through the air, it actually whistles. You have to be that close to the field to notice it. When it hits the glove, it makes a really loud pop. So the woman comes up and she says, here, coach, here's your ceremonial baseball, gold lettering, squash coach, squash god. This is great. This is where I belong. She says, OK, now what we're going to have is the national anthem, and then you will go out and throw out your first pitch. So we're standing on the first baseline with my peeps, and it is the longest rendition of the national anthem in the history of man. So by the end of this, I am now shivering, and it's ladies and gentlemen, and my name is echoing off the green monster. And I'm thinking 47,000 people are going to have an amazing treat tonight. I jog out to the mound. I look 60 feet 6 inches away. There's Jason Veritek. I think to myself, curveball, slider, I don't know. But I'm bringing the heat. Well, at this moment, my drunk daughter and all of her girlfriends start chanting my name. So of course I'm going to wave to the small people. And as I turn to wave, there I am on the big screen TV, 90 feet tall. And it's at that moment that I realize this is not going to be the most special night of my life. I look to home plate. I can't find Jason Veritek. He's a mile away. At this moment, I am struck by this mysterious ailment. My left arm withers. The ball is stuck in my fingers. I don't know what I'm going to do. I shot put this ball out of my hand. It bounces seven times before home plate. And it rolls to a stop in a mud puddle. Jason Veritek scoops up this muddy orb, runs out to the mound, hands me this and says, nice pitch, coach. And now I'm mortified. I can't get off the field fast enough. And as I'm running through the box seats of all these drunk Bostonians that are eating their clam chowder, one guy pats me on the tush and he says, that's great, US Olympic coach of the year. What the F is squash? <laughs> now, I've since thrown out the first pitch nine more times. And Mrs. Asiente didn't raise a stupid boy. So the next time I got on the mound, I beckoned to Jason to come a little closer. And somehow, this time, I got the ball all the way to his glove. And when I got off the field, within seconds, my cell phone rang. And it was my dear old dad. And he said, son, I'm so proud of you. But if that man was any closer to you, you could have handed him the ball. <laughs> so we have about three minutes for questions, because I know we have to finish at 9 o'clock. Do any of you have any? Yes, sir. What is squash? What is squash? <laughs> so squash is a combination of tennis and racquetball. It's played in a four-wall court. It's a very fast game. It's played with a pretty dead ball. And it's a game that's really tough on the body. A very physical sport, which you wouldn't think Trinity would be known for. It's, you know, the bastion of male dominance down there, but we're pretty good at it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do you recruit heavily for it? Yes, sir. So the question is, do I recruit heavily? 
the, the strongest squash in the world is not played in the United States, which is disappointing for me because I am the U.S. coach. We, this past year, the, a lineup has nine people in it. This past year, we had nine players from nine different countries. So it's, it's all international. And so when I travel around the world with the U.S. team, I develop relationships with the other national coaches because, as I said, it's all about relationships and they help me find the young men who are academically qualified and who can come over and, and play at Trinity College. Yes, sir? When will we see some squash boys in Springfield College? And you know, the day that I get a phone call from President Cooper <laughs> saying we need to start a squash program up here, and I can promise you we can win a national championship in three years. <laughs> I will be in my car so fast, <laughs> there will just be waves going by. One more question. Anybody? Okay, let's not beat a dead horse to death. It has been an incredible honor to come back to my alma mater. One thing I will tell you about Springfield, 44 years later, I had no idea the impact that this place had on my life. This it changed, every, this was not the happiest four years of my life. I, I struggled, but I learned so many things that guaranteed for me in the future success. And uh, I am incredibly indebted, as I said to the president before I came in, I cannot give enough back to Springfield College. And if you look at my uh, history of philanthropy to Springfield, sadly that is true. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very intriguing how we, we tend to find sports personalities always equate to the business side of things. He is the first speaker I've ever heard about uh, generating a balance in that conversation much about personal life versus business life. I think that's very important in today's society. We tend to lose track of those balances and he was very point on about bringing that back. So I was very impressed. Uh, not only is he a, you know, a very uh, great speaker, but I think he's a great motivator for all of us in the business community to bring it back to what's really important, that is family and how families interact in our business life. Paul's speech was amazing, and the message that he shared about living every day to its fullest is essential for everybody, because we never know what's going to happen in life, and to end the day and go home and prioritize and know that we did do the best we could um, is absolutely essential for everybody. It's what brings joy to our lives, and prioritizing family or partners and knowing that that really is the most important thing in life is critical. Um, having that proper balance when we have so many things to manage are really important messages and I'm so glad that I was here to um, be with him and be present at this event today. Oh my gosh, I'm so happy that I stayed for the presentation. A lot of times people dip out, but when I saw his face, I knew I was in for a special treat. And he did not disappoint, I can tell you. One of the things that really resonated with me was how he spoke about family. We're all busy, we're all busy being busy, but having that undivided attention that he spoke of, I wrote that down because I, I'm going to commit to doing that for my family. I travel a great deal, they need my undivided attention when I get home. So that was my great takeaway. I loved it. Paul was engaging and I think what meant a lot to me was the notion that, number one, you don't have to take yourself so seriously all the time and number two really just be present every day make some conscious decisions don't be on autopilot and I think we can take that with us um, immediately I mean I'll go back to the office now do things a little differently maybe this afternoon that I might not have done had I not heard Paul this morning